Welcome to the Cancer Interviews Podcast, where we are sharing the cancer journey together through interviews with ordinary people whose lives have somehow been impacted by cancer. And now today's host, former prostate cancer patient who underwent successful brachytherapy treatment, also known as SEEDS, and very grateful cancer survivor, Bruce Morton. Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce Morton. You know, it's tough enough to go through one cancer journey, but for some, they have to fight off cancer more than once. Our guest on this episode is Michelle Beck of Tigard, Oregon. Not only is she a two-time breast cancer survivor, but she continues to carry the fight by doing what she can to help others diagnosed with breast cancer. So without further ado, here she is, Michelle Beck. And Michelle, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Bruce, thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be here and to share my story on your platform, so thank you. And we look forward to hearing it. But before we get into the cancer-related part of your story, Michelle, what we'd like to do is learn a little bit more about our guests as people exclusive of cancer. So if you would tell us a little bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and when you have time to have fun, what you like to do for fun. Sure thing. So I'm actually from Southern California. I now live in Tigard, Oregon, just south of Portland. And I've been here for 13 years and I love it. I needed the change and I left Southern California and found a whole new life. I am happily married for 11 years and I have a 10 year old son and four older bonus kids, age 16 to 23. I work at an organization called Breast Friends of Oregon, which helps women go through breast cancer or other women's cancers and to know that they have the support that they are not alone. And I love it. I also host a podcast of my own called Breast Friends Cancer Support Network, which is the joy of my life. And I'm, I love that. I'm having such a wonderful time with it. And in my free time, which I don't have a lot of, hence the wife, mother, worker, et cetera. My husband and I, we have a travel trailer and we love to take it out, especially to the Oregon coast. And we have two dogs who go with us, a golden retriever and a black lab. So my life is pretty full. Well, as a native Californian who lived in Oregon for about five years, uh, quite some time ago, uh, I have an idea of the allure you're talking about, but if you could be a little more specific, what are some of the things that you like about Oregon that you left behind when you moved from Southern California? Uh, I love the weather. I love that there are actually seasons here. Fall is my favorite. It is the most gorgeous time of year. And I've lived here for 13 years and I still every fall like take out my camera and take pictures of all the beautiful leaves. And uh, I love rain. I think rain is refreshing and it's cleansing. And I honestly, I love the cooler temperatures, notwithstanding the crazy heat waves we've had this summer. Um, I'm not super outdoorsy, but I love having that option. Everyone's like, oh, do you hike and do you do this? And not a big hiker. Um, some of the medication that I'm on currently because of my cancer precludes that, but we still, we definitely try to get outside as much as possible and just enjoy the beauty that Oregon holds. And you're living the good life going to the Oregon coast whenever you can. I've been there before. And so I know uh, of the magnetic pull that it has. Uh, question for you as we move into your, uh, the, the more cancer related part of your life um, if you would think back to when uh, your life was pre-diagnosis, um, what was your health like at that point? I was pretty healthy. I was a later in life mom. I had my son at 39 and he was a toddler and I was staying at home with him. Everything was great. I'd waited so long to become a mom and I was really enjoying life everything was good. And it really just hit me out of the blue. Now, reading up a little bit on you, Michelle, I learned that, uh, that you did have, your family did have a bit of a history with breast cancer. To any degree, did that prepare you or uh, reduce the, the shock level when you got your diagnosis? You know, it's a funny question because I... I had this feeling in my head that I always knew that I was going to get it. And maybe I'm, I'm a little bit of a fatalist in that way. You know, tr I try to be positive, but there's some little things that creep into your head. I had watched my, my father's mother 
she died from breast cancer. She had it three times over a period of 25 years. And at the end, I was in between jobs, life situations, and I was able to spend some time with her, which I so value to this day. But in the back of my head, there was always that little thing like, oh, this could really happen to you. But gosh, when it did, it's still so incredibly shocking to hear those words, you have cancer. Because even though I'm very close, it happened to my grandmother and it also happened to my mother-in-law the year that my husband and I married. So it was definitely a part of my life. But wow, when it actually is you, it, it just sends you into survival mode. Question, uh, as, as we move along, uh, your first diagnosis, could you describe the, the chain of events that led to it? Sure. I was first diagnosed in 2012. I had my regular mammograms scheduled in December and I had started at 37, age 37, earlier than recommended because I knew I had the family history and I wanted to make sure that I was being proactive. Uh, I got the call back saying, oh, you need to come back. You have a, a mass that we'd like to take a look at. And I was fortunate enough to have my husband go with me to have the ultrasound and the, and the biopsy, or excuse me, ultrasound and whatever else they did that first time, I have cancer brain, but he was there. And then while we were there, they said, yeah, we, we really want to take a little bit more look at this. And they had a biopsy that day ready for me. It's unlike anything that I'd ever experienced. Unfortunately, women, if, you, if you've had the, or men, if you've had that biopsy, you know it's, it is no fun. And it sounds like a stapler going off in your body. And there's no way to really prepare for that. Once I was in there and I had the, the procedures done, I, I knew 100% in my head that it was cancer. I wasn't positive, obviously, until two days later when they called to confirm. And I got my diagnosis confirmation on December 7th, which I always joke about it now. It's a date that will forever live in infamy. Not that my body is like Pearl Harbor, but it's a date that I will never forget because it really led to huge changes in my life. Um, I remember that day driving home from the appointment of the biopsy, talking to my mother. And she was like, so what are you doing? What's going on? And, and I lied to my mom, which is funny because even as an adult, I don't lie to my mother because I didn't want her to worry unless there was something to worry about. And I think about that later and it was so traumatic actually having to go back and tell my parents, even though I was 41 years old, that I had breast cancer, especially my father, because his mother had passed from it. That was incredibly hard. By the way, if you like what you hear on this segment, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast by checking on the links below. Once there, you'll see a bell icon. And if you click on that, we will notify you when we post a new interview. Now, it sounds like, Michelle, uh, for a number of reasons, you were sort of prepared for this. But um, even if you're prepared, um, Still, the, the words, you have cancer, uh, that's, that's a singular moment and, and uh, not in a good way. Obviously, this was unpleasant, but, uh, but as you think back to that, what was your reaction as you thought about the present and the future? Complete shock. And it's very funny because since I had lived with it with my grandmother, I had always said to my husband, if this ever happens to me, I'm getting a mastectomy, I'm getting rid of my breasts, I don't need them. However, when it really happened to me and it came down to it, I couldn't make that decision. I'm very lucky that my diagnosis was caught early. I was stage one. I was ERPR positive, HER2 negative, which in the cancer community, breast cancer, that is quote unquote the best cancer to have because it is the most treatable. And my oncologist was like, you have choices. I didn't want choices. I wanted them to tell me what to do. But I opted to have a lumpectomy with radiation because my chances of survival were the same versus that versus a mastectomy. My son at the time was 18 months old and I was not ready to give up the cuddle time, the hugging time, all of the things that went with that if I could just have a lumpectomy and radiation. And so that's what I chose. <laughs> um, silly me, four years later, excuse me, in uh, 2000. 17, so it was December, 
my first diagnosis, 2012. My second was January of 2017. I got smart and I moved my mammograms from December until January because man, I hit my deductibles two years in a row when I had my cancer the first time and I was not gonna do that again. So I moved them to January and I had a new primary occurrence in my other breast in 2017. I, my husband, bless his heart, he had wanted me in 2012 to get a mastectomy and I chose not to. 2017, he was kind enough to not say, I told you so. At the right time in 2012, that was, that was the right thing for me to do. And my second battle in 2017, yes, it was a lot different. I had a new primary occurrence in my other breast, same diagnosis, almost identical to my first one. But at that point, I was like, okay, shame on me once, not twice. And so I opted to have a bilateral mastectomy with full reconstruction, a full hysterectomy because my ovaries were producing estrogen still and my cancer fed on estrogen. And then a reconstruction surgery later that summer. So 2017 was an insanely difficult year for me. I'm four years out now and I can, I can look back on it and, and laugh about some things and cry about some things still, but I'm here and that's what is so important. Now, Michelle, let's go backwards just a bit. For somebody who is watching and they think they might be a candidate for breast cancer, they might want to know a little bit more about the lumpectomy. If you would just relive some of the, the key points of that treatment. Of course. When you compare a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy, a lumpectomy for me, very easy. It is, of course, but when you're going into surgery for the first time for something like this, you have no idea what's going on. And I remember being a nervous wreck. Thankfully, I had wonderful surgical team, wonderful oncologist, but for a lumpectomy, what they do, they essentially... For my type, they, you go in early that morning and they do something called a wire location of your tumor or your mass. So they go in with an ultrasound on the outside and then on the inside they put a wire in your breast and essentially pin the tumor so the surgeon in the operating room knows how to find it. So literally my incision was probably about an inch. They're amazing what they can do. They go in. I'm out, of course, thankfully, and they go in, they take out your mask, they sew you back up, and you go home. I, I went home the same day, actually. I, even having cancer twice, I've spent two nights in the hospital. So the te surgical techniques now are amazing. I was up and moving around, uh, honestly, a few days later. It was a fairly easy recovery, and a few months later, I started radiation. I had seven weeks of radiation every day, so I would drive to the hospital back and forth, and I learned at that time that books on tape were my best friend. So I wasn't bored being in the car, I looked forward to being in the car, and essentially my treatment was over the first time around after the lumpectomy, the radiation, and then I took tamoxifen for four years, which is a hormone, um, essentially blocks the cancer from attaching to your cells. In, in layman's terms, I guess. Okay, we talked about the lumpectomy, and uh, as for the uh, mastectomy, what was the toughest part of that? Oh my gosh, um, a mastectomy is challenging, that is for sure. The, cha the changes that it makes in your body, and it's not even, there's the emotional aspect of it because I had my breasts removed, which are part of something I identify with as a woman, but really the physicality of it is very challenging. I had both done at the same time. My left breast was a little bit more work because I had previously four years prior been radiated on that breast. And you cannot expand skin and muscle that has been radiated. It just, it won't hold together. And since I wanted to have reconstructive surgery, I had to have a latissimus back flap on my left side. So the doctors are amazing. They go around, once they removed all your breast tissue, they go around to your back, 
underneath the skin and I have an incision on my back um, about this wide, four inches wide and mid back and they take skin and muscle and they wrap it around and pull it underneath and fill out the exterior part of that breast. It's, I'm still amazed that they can do this. And that is how they were able to reconstruct my breast with expanders and allow the fresh new skin from my back to expand. I'm, I'm still in awe of all the things they can do with the human body. Well, but, Michelle, you, you bring up something interesting because we have a, we have a guest from a previous <clears throat> segment who is cancer-free since 1993. Which, nice. is a, which is a wonderful statistic, but yes. uh, I'm sure already in the back of your mind, you're processing what she probably had to go through in terms of treatment circa 1993. Oh, I cannot even imagine. I'm, I know I'm very fortunate currently with the medical advances we have. And honestly, women in 10 years are gonna be better. And maybe in 20 years, we won't have to deal with this anymore. Uh, I'm just so fortunate. I have a wonderful team that really gave me a lot of options and support when I needed it. As, as you had asked, Bruce, also during the healing portion of the mastectomy, it's, there are times when you can't lift your arms. I had to have my family help me wash and blow dry my hair to get shirts on and off. And there were times when I couldn't lift my arms higher than my head. And I've done a lot of physical therapy. I've done myofascial therapy, which is amazing. And it's really helped me to be able to move my body again. A couple weeks ago, I leaned up to the kitchen counter, counter and I grabbed something way up here. And I'm like, I looked at my husband, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can move my arms again. And it's something that you never think is gonna happen while it's happening because it's, there's definitely some depression and anxiety that were brought up for me during that time period because my body had changed so much. But now, you know, I can look back on this and say, wow, it does get better. It just, it takes time and give your time body to heal and be your own advocate and do your therapies and do your exercise because it does get better. My body has changed, but I'm here and that's what is really most important. And you, you mentioned, you, you almost make it, make it sound like uh, you are whole again or, or, or pretty close. You know, I am, I am whole with some different parts. In the beginning, I, I joked because in the breast cancer community, I am, we are fond if we have reconstruction, we like to show them off because they're, you know, something that was created by our surgical teams and we really like to help other women who haven't gone through it yet to know what they look like. And so I used to joke, I'm like, oh, you can see them because they're not mine. But really over time, I've learned to embrace them again and say, you know what, they are mine. They're part of my body. And really what was taken out was the cancer. And I am still whole because it's, it's a mental thing. It's, you know, on the outside, no one would know. It's just me in my head that thinks, oh, it's a little bit different. But, you know, it just, I'm grateful for what I have. Well, you can raise your arms now like, like you could before. Is there anything that you can't do now that you could do before, before, the, before your diagnosis? Sure. Uh, one thing that is really challenging for me is I'm currently on an aromatase inhibitor. So my cancer fed on estrogen. Okay, so I took out my ovaries to stop the estrogen production. But our bodies are smart enough that they take testosterone and turn it into estrogen. So you can't, you can't get rid of everything. So the medication that I take now, it stops the reaction from the testosterone turning into the estrogen, and that's called aromatase. And I struggle with this medication. It gives me a lot of joint pain, muscle pain. My hands and my feet hurt a lot. And so I can't be as physically active as I would like. One thing, like we, like I said, I don't, I don't really go on hikes. I can't walk for long periods of time because my feet just ache. And there are things that I do to help. I've, I found that some CBD and some THC products help with lessening the pain. I've, I use different oils and, and rubs and magnesium. I take all my supplements. And while those things do help, the physical part of 
really exercising is, is hard. One thing that I have found that I love, we purchased a Peloton bike last year. And now I can do that because I'm not putting pressure on my feet. So I've, I've never been one to say, oh my gosh, I really want to go out and exercise or ride my bike. But now every day I'm anxious to go get on my Peloton because I enjoy it. And I know I'm moving my body and I'm sweating and it's good for me and it doesn't hurt. So that's probably the biggest thing that's really changed is I've had to figure out different ways to move my body that don't hurt. Now, Michelle, let's go back to the lumpectomy and the mastectomy again. Um, and this is something for you to share with your audience and something I suspect you have shared with your audience on Breast Friends. And we're going to get to Breast Friends in a minute. But um, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently in terms of your mental approach or anything else to your two procedures? Sure. Uh, there's always that part of me that says, wow, if I would have gotten a mastectomy the first time, but... If I look back on it really in the big picture, it wouldn't have brought me where I am today because I found Breast Friends, the organization that I work for and have found my best friends through that organization. So I can't say that I wish I would have done it differently that way. But one thing to remember for those out there before surgeries, trust your surgical team, but if you have questions, ask them. If you feel like you need a second opinion, go get it. No one is ever going to be offended by you getting a second opinion. And if they are, that means you definitely need a second opinion because your surgical team and your care team, they're really there to support you and answer all of your questions. I'm very fortunate that I found a great team right off. I have a nurse navigator who is amazing and she helped me through my first diagnosis. She's the one who actually gave me my second diagnosis. So just finding that, that the, the support you need, even if it's before your surgeries or when you're first diagnosed, that is critical. Because while you may have wonderful friends and family, and I do have an amazing support system in that, they haven't had cancer other than my mother-in-law and she's amazing but it's really helpful to find people who've been through it because they can be your support and i think that's the really the most important thing is make sure you have your good care team and you're secure in that and that you have a good support system in place because surgeries are no joke it is great to have friends who will set up meal trains for you or even if someone will come do your laundry every now and then. My sister gave me the best gift of all was she paid for house cleaners during my treatment because I couldn't do it. And there was kids in and out of my house and dogs. And so having that, having friends and family who will literally just be there and surrounding yourself with those people is the best thing you can do for yourself. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your support system. We've heard uh, some of, of the things that were done to help you along your cancer journey before, during, and maybe even after. Uh, what are some of the things you haven't mentioned that you got by way of support from friends and family? Randomly just dropping by with coffee or Jamba Juice or flowers. Uh, I, you know, some people think flowers are just useless. I think they're wonderful because to me it shows that anything that shows that you made an effort to think about me and to do something that will make me happier, I appreciate. I have another girlfriend who gave me this amazing care package before my first surgery, which included a, a cashmere sweater that I still wear to this day, lotions, candles, stuff to really help with she didn't know what else she could do, so she gave me things that were comforting and really gave me a nice sense of security. And I knew every time I put on that sweater that she was there for me. And um, yeah, the house cleaning, the meal trains. My husband is 100% my rock. He very busy with work always, but when I was going through my surgeries and, and post, he was there bringing me food, helping me with my drains, which that's a whole nother side of the mastectomy, which <laughs> is an interesting conversation, but listening because it, he really couldn't fix me because the medical professionals had to get rid of the cancer and get me to the point where I was no evidence of disease, but he listened. And sometimes I'm crazy ravings of a crying woman because 
oh my gosh, I have cancer and we have a young son. And then, oh my gosh, I have cancer again. And he's a kindergartner. And now I have to, I'm choosing to have a mastectomy and reassuring me that he's still going to love me, even though my body is different and my brain is different because cancer really does. It changes you in a lot of ways, but you need to find those ways to move forward and take those changes and become a better person from it. And I really feel like my support system helped me with that. Now, you mentioned cancer brain. We have heard the term chemo brain from time to time from, uh, from certain guests. But uh, some of our guests who encounter this, uh, they have their ways of encountering it. They'll, uh, they'll use their cell phone, their iPad to make mental notes for them for upcoming events. Have you done that, Michelle? One hundred percent. If if I don't have a post-it in front of me or my phone to write something down, don't talk to me because I cannot remember a lot there. I can remember things I did in high school, but I literally can't remember things two days ago. Um, drives my husband crazy, but I joke that it's one of the one of the wonderful gifts that menopause has given because after my hysterectomy, I was put into surgical menopause. So one thing that if you're not familiar with out there, estrogen is really important to our brain functioning. And I do not have any of that in my body and I cannot supplement. So I'm having some memory issues. It's no fun, but as much as I can, I try to joke about it because there's not a whole lot I can do about it. So I do, I make lists, I take notes. I, I have found other ways to combat that because I need to know what's going on. So if I have to write it down, I do. Our guest is Michelle Beck of Tigard, Oregon. She is a two-time breast cancer survivor, but uh, her involvement with cancer and the fight against it is not in her re rearview mirror. It's very much a part of her present with her involvement with the support group, Breast Friends. So let's start at the start as far as that goes, Michelle. When did you first find out about Breast Friends? Yes, I am fortunate enough that I actually live about a mile from Breast Friends and I drove by it all the time. When I went through my first cancer bout in 2012, I really felt like I had somewhat of an easy journey compared to many and I kind of moved on with my life. I had my lumpectomy, my radiation, my medication, and I moved on. Well, four years later, in 2017, I had my second round and I went through all of my treatment and I needed to do something. I was a stay at home mom and I took a job at my son's school as a cafeteria lady or lunch lady, I, whatever we want to call it. I don't know what it was, teaching assistant. But literally during lunchtime, I would walk around and talk to the kids, give them bathroom passes, make sure things were okay. It was two hours a day and I got to be around my son and all of his friends. The problem was I couldn't be on my feet even for two hours a day. And so after three days, I had to go into the principal who I'm friends with and say, I can't do it. And it kind of sent me into a mental spiral. And I just had this light bulb go on in my head that said, hey, go to that organization because you can volunteer there because nonprofits always need volunteers. And so I left school that day and I drove directly to Breast Friends and I went in and I met with Allison Hancock, who's now our executive director. At the time, she was the volunteer coordinator, among many other things. And I gave my application to be a volunteer. And she kind of looked at me, and I think she could sense that I had been crying and I was upset. And she took me over to meet Yvonne Nydigger, who was then the director of programs. I sat down with her in her office, and I cried for an hour, going through my whole journey the challenges that I was facing, that I felt useless because I couldn't even work a short period of time at my son's school. And now in 2021, she's my best friend. Yvonne is the silver lining to my cancer journey. So I started volunteering there at Breast Friends, basically doing data entry, because that's what I'm good at. I'm a former chief level executive, of, uh, executive assistant in my past life and computers were my jam. Like I, you know, I was very good at that scheduling and data entry and just all kinds of things like that. So that's what I started to do. Data entry for a hat project, breast friends, mails out 
hats free of charge to women around the country who've been through chemo and they have funny sayings on them. So anyone out there, if you need them, go to our website, breastfriends.org, and you can go to programs and sign up for a funny baseball cap with funny sayings to be delivered to you. So I started give me, volunteering. Give me an example of a funny saying. Sure. There's actually two of them. Um, one is, has anyone seen my hair? And it's a little caricature of a bald woman, and there's a little rabbit next to her, and it's H-A-R-E. So they're looking for the bunny. And, gosh, the other one, th this is where cancer brain is coming in. The other one is, oh, temporarily bald, permanently beautiful. And the caricature of a woman and a heart on top. And they come in pink and teal. So if anyone out there is looking for something like that, just go to our website and, and put your name in and you can get one. So I loved doing that. And I volunteered there for a year and a half helping with programs, events. I love helping with event coordination, setting up gift baskets and silent auctions. And they could really see that I was very passionate about it. I started volunteering probably six hours a week. And then eventually they called me into the office and I was like, oh my gosh, am, am I in trouble? Why am I being called into the office? And they hired me as an employee. So I was incredibly honored to do that. So I've been working for the organization for about two and a half years now. I was the program's assistant. So I would help the director, Yvonne, set up various workshops, support groups, events, outings, things like that. And she and I just were a great team and we worked really well together. She has since retired a few months ago. So we've changed things around in the organization. And I was given the opportunity to take over as the host of our weekly podcast, Breast Friends Cancer Support Network. And now every week I am fortunate enough to be able to interview cancer survivors, practitioners, healthcare workers, naturopaths, just a variety of, of people who really are helpful in the cancer community. And I love it. It's, it's something that really speaks to my heart because I get to talk to people all the time about what they can do to help cancer patients or how cancer has changed their life and made it better. So I, I love it. I could not be happier with what I'm doing. And do you see breast friends widening its scope even more? In other words, I'm sure Breast Friends is doing much more than, uh, than in the early part of the century when it was founded. But uh, what is the vision for the future? Are there, are there certain things you're not doing now, but they're, they're kind of on the support group's bucket list? Yes, actually. Um, let me give you a brief rundown of what we do do so we can talk about that. So Breast Friends was founded in 2020 by two women, Sharon Hennepin and Becky Olson, both cancer survivors. Um, at that point, Becky, unfortunately, has since passed away. So we, we do everything to, right now to honor her memory. She left us quite a legacy. But the organization really was founded so women do not go through cancer alone. We have support groups and set around various areas of Portland, which were in person and now we're doing virtually. Some are getting back to be in person, which is great. There's a walk and talk groups and they, there's walks set up around the area so people can join in. There is a young survivors group for women really that were diagnosed young that have different challenges than those women who were diagnosed later in life. We have a rainbow warrior support group for those in the LGBTQA community because you know no matter who you love you still get cancer so we're really there trying to support everyone we do a few big events every year we just finished up our annual golf tournament which is super fun a two-day event and it's a, a fundraiser for the organization because we are a nonprofit. we also have a wonderful thing which i adore called the bald is beautiful program where women who have gone through chemo they get to go get professionally made up uh, full makeup and they bring in their their fun clothes and we take photo shoots of them with a professional photographer and they get to have all these prints for free and to really show them that it's not your hair that makes you beautiful it is your smile and your inner your inner light and in the past few years we've actually in enhanced that program to invite people's families to come in so they either have their children their spouses their animals in the pictures with them and it's just a really good reminder to show you 
show them that cancer does not take the light or the beauty from you. So that's an amazing program. Oh, gosh, there's, there's so many things that we do. Um, but one thing we would like to expand on in the future is doing somewhat of a, um, a camp like a, a, a sleepaway camp for, for, for women. There's a few other organizations out there that do it, but there's, we have in the past, we've done weekend retreats at the coast, like two days, and they work on thriving beyond cancer or specific issues that support young warriors. But one thing that we really hope to do in the future is go out you know, to a camp that's already established as a summer camp and rent that out for three or four days to have... 50 or 100 women there together who can really come together, listen to facilitators talk about various issues that are important to them and just have that. That's something that is really on our, on our bucket list to be able to provide. But it's, it's not something that's inexpensive. So we're hoping that we've, we've applied for a few other grants this year that that's something that we could work on for 2022. Now, one other thing, uh, Michelle, then we're going to wrap things up. Um, all these things you mentioned are, are things that are easily accessible to people in the Portland metro area. But in this Internet-driven world that we live in, somebody in Indiana or Alabama, I suspect, could access your services, at least in a, in a virtual kind of way, I suspect. Yes, definitely. Before, um, we were really virtual we were open mainly to those in the Portland metro area because that's where we were based. But now we've really expanded into a lot of uh, Zoom programs. And we've done now really a lot of our support groups are over Zoom because we can reach a bigger audience. And especially with the HAP program, the virtual support groups that we have, we're really hoping to bring breast friends to a bigger community um, across the nation. All right, Michelle, before we get to our final question, let's um, let people know how they can get hold of Breast Friends, your, uh, your web address or any, any other pertinent information that uh, women should know if they want to avail themselves of your many, many services. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, we can be reached at breastfriends.org online. Uh, that is our website. And you can click on the patient programs for the different services that we have. There is a calendar where you can look at the different upcoming events, which are either in person or virtual, and you can sign up there. You can hear me on a weekly basis at Breast Friends Cancer Support Network on Voice America or on all of the regular podcast platforms. So please subscribe because I would love to expand my reach because I really, I feel that what we're doing is really valuable for connection and inspiration. And I hope listeners out there do as well. You can follow us on Instagram at Breast Friends PDX. Uh, we, have, we do have a Breast Friends of Oregon Facebook page, and there is Breast Friends also on Twitter, but I will say we're not as active on Twitter right now. So the, the Facebook and Instagram is the, where we really put our social media. All right, Michelle, we're going to wrap up and we're going to wrap up the way we always do with the same question. Mm -hmm. Some of this, uh, some of the answer for your question is something you've already covered, but in this situation, we don't mind being redundant. But if you were approached, if you came into contact with somebody face to face or online who had just been diagnosed with breast cancer, you might have a multifaceted message for that person. But if you could pick out one point, one overarching point that you would like to share with us that you would share with that person what would it be that they are not alone and no matter what they're going through it does get better they might be having surgery or craziness or you know they might even be living with a disease however but surround yourself with support don't be afraid to ask for help uh, there's no place for pride in cancer treatment because we all need help and inspiration and support just and be your own best advocate. I think that was like four things. I don't know. <laughs> okay, wonderful, Michelle. And uh, wise words from you and inspiring words, not only for what you've gone through, but what you're still doing. So, Michelle, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us on Cancer Interviews. Thank you, Bruce. I am honored and um, I would love to come back at any time. <laughs> And we'll keep that in mind because, uh, as I might have mentioned, you are the fourth guest that we have had on our program from Breast Friends. And uh, 44 would not be too many because the message never gets old and, and it, needs to be, uh, it needs to be driven home. So, Michelle, once again, thanks so much. Thank you, Bruce. Have a great day. 
you too, Michelle. And that's going to wrap up this episode of Cancer Interviews. We hope that what you heard can be informational and inspirational, and it'll, it'll work either for you or for a loved one. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.